Good evening. I'm Alexander Rose. I'm the executive director here at the Long Now Foundation. And uh, just a few days ago, we hit a, a big milestone in membership here at Long Now. We finally surpassed 10,000 members that have signed up. Thank you. And uh, we, we spent a lot of time figuring out who gets to be member 10,000. Um, and uh, so the answer we came up with was that any member in good standing uh, is basically part of a drawing that we're going to do, I think, tomorrow. Um, and uh, so if, uh, if you're a current member, uh, you have the chance to become member 10,000. So uh, definitely make sure you're current tonight when you go home and uh, you'll, be, you'll be in the mix. Good evening. I'm Stuart Brand from Long Now. Um, about 50 years ago, the Apollo program, hi Rusty, um, got photographs of the Earth from space, got people off planet, and we started thinking of this place as a planet. And that introduced us to astronomical time and may well be part of why something like the Long Now Foundation and thinking long term and all of that came to be both thinkable and actionable. And therefore, it's particularly appropriate to have as a speaker tonight the Britain's uh, Astronomer Royal, who was also president of the Royal Society which basically invented modern science. And so, along with having an astronomical perspective on everything, he's aware of all the science going on and all of the technology that's spinning out of that. And who better to speak about basically the future of everything than Martin Rees? Well, thank you very much, Stuart. It's a great pleasure and privilege to be here in front of this audience, but uh, hard to follow that wonderful uh, uh, movie clip. Uh, my talk is going to be mainly predictions and forecasts, but I'm going to start with a flashback to the Middle Ages, inspired by this cathedral in Ely, 10 miles from where I live. For medieval people, the entire cosmology from creation to apocalypse was just a few thousand years. They were bewildered and helpless in the face of floods and pestilences and prone to irrational dread. They lived in turbulent and uncertain times. But they built cathedrals. This immense and glorious building was constructed with primitive technology by masons who knew they wouldn't live to see it finished and it still inspires us almost a millennium later. Our horizons in space and time are now vastly extended, as are our resources and knowledge. But today it's only organizations like Long Now that think centuries ahead. This seems a paradox, but there is a reason. The lives of medieval people played out against a backdrop that changed little from one generation to the next. Their children and grandchildren lived the same lives that they did. But for us, unlike for them, the next century would be drastically different, and we can't foresee it, nor plan for it. So there's been an explosive disjunction between the ever-shortening timescale of social and technical change and the multi-billion year time spans of biology, geology, and cosmology. A few years ago, I met a well-known Indian tycoon. And he knew I had the title Astronomer Royal, as Stuart mentioned. And he asked, do you do the Queen's horoscopes? <laughs> <laughs> and I responded with a straight face, well, if she wanted one, I'm the man she'd ask. He then seemed eager to hear my predictions, and I went, took a straight face, and I said, well, stock markets will fluctuate, trouble in the Middle East, and things like that. <laughs> and he listened sagely, but I then came clean, and I said, I'm only a scientist, an astronomer. 
and he then lost all interest <laughs> in my predictions. And rightly so, because scientists are pretty rotten forecasters. Almost as bad as an economist, but not quite. <laughs> are, there, are there no economists here? <laughs> right. So my forecast will be very tentative, especially in front of an audience where there are people with far more expertise than me on each of the several topics I'll address. About 14 years ago, I wrote a book which I entitled Our Final Century? Question mark. My publishers deleted the question mark. <laughs> and the Ameri but the American publishers changed the title to Our Final Hour. I, I guess uh, you guys like instant gratification and the reverse. <laughs> well, that book typecasts me as a doomster and Luddite, and I've tried to counter that a bit in my new book, advertised here, <laughs> by offering some scientific optimism despite political pessimism. And the theme is this. The Earth existed for... 45 million centuries, but this century is special. It's the first when one species, namely ours, has the planet's future in its hands. We're deep in the Anthropocene. We could irreversibly degrade the biosphere, or we could trigger the transition from biological to electronic intelligence. Or our misdirected technology could cause a catastrophic setback to civilization. We've had one lucky escape already. At any time in the Cold War, when armaments escalated beyond all reason, the superpowers could have stumbled towards Armageddon through muddle and miscalculation. And that threat is merely in abeyance. Nuclear weapons are based on 20th century science. I'll focus later in my talk on 21st century sciences, bio, cyber, robotics and space which all offer huge potential benefits, but also expose us to novel vulnerabilities. But before that, let's focus on the long-term threats that stem not from conscious decisions, but from humanity's ever heavier collective footprint. Because here, even with a cloudy crystal ball, there are some things we can predict. For instance, by mid-century, the world will be more crowded. Fifty years ago, world population was about three and a half billion. It's now about 7.6 billion. And the growth has been mainly in Asia and Africa, as shown in this map, where regions are scaled in proportion to their growth in the last 30 years. But the growth is slowing. The number of births per year worldwide actually peaked a few years ago. Nonetheless, Population going up in some areas, and world population is forecast to rise to about 9 billion by 2050. That's partly because most people in the developing world are young, and they're yet to have children, and they live longer. The age histogram in the developing world on the left, lots of young people, will become more like the one on the right for Western Europe where the birth rate has not increased and most people live a long time. And as the upper part of the left hand one fattens up, that will give a big rise in population, even if the birth rate doesn't go up. And the main growth is in East Asia, and it's there that the world's human financial resources will become concentrated, which will actually end four centuries of North Atlantic dominance. And the other big change is there's more urbanization. And to prevent megacities becoming turbulent dystopias will surely be a major challenge to governance. Population growth seems under-discussed, partly perhaps because of doom-laden forecasts by, for instance, Paul Ehrlich and the Club of Rome, which proved off the mark. Also, some deem population growth to be a taboo subject, tainted by association with uh, eugenics in the 20s and 30s, with Indian policies under Indira Gandhi, and more recently with China's hardline 
one-child policy. As it's turned out, contrary to the worst predictions, food production and resource extraction have kept pace with rising population. Famines still occur, but they're due to conflict or maldistribution, not overall scarcity. But the capacity of the world to cope depends on lifestyle. It couldn't sustain its present population if everyone lived as profligately as the better-off Americans do today. Each uses as much energy and eating as much beef. On the other hand, 20 billion could live sustainably with a very ascetic quality of life if all adopted a vegan diet, didn't travel, lived in small high-density apartments and interacted via super-internet and virtual reality. This scenario is fairly improbable, obviously, and certainly not alluring. But the spread between these two indicates it's naive to quote one headline figure for the world's carrying capacity. To feed 9 billion by mid-century will require improved agriculture, low-till, water-conserving, and perhaps GM crops, and maybe dietary innovations, converting insects, highly nutritious and rich in proteins, into palatable food, and making artificial meat, really great new technology. And to quote Gandhi, there'll be enough for everyone's need, but not for everyone's greed. Population trends beyond 2050 are harder to predict because enhanced education and empowerment of women, surely a benign thing in itself, could reduce fertility rates where they're now highest. But the demographic transition, so-called, hasn't reached parts of India and sub-Saharan Africa. On the other hand, if families in Africa remain large, then according to the UN projections, that continent's population could double again between 2050 and 2100 to 4 billion. Nigeria alone would then have as big a population as Europe and North America combined. And Africa's population would be nearly 10 times Western Europe's. Well, optimists say that each extra mouth brings two hands and a brain. It does. But it's the geopolitical strains that worry me most. Sub-Saharan Africa can't escape poverty as the so-called Asian tigers did by undercutting Western manufacturing costs, which robots could do manufacturing now. And they may not have toilets, but they do have smartphones. They know the injustice of their fate, they know what they're missing, and migration is easy. This is a recipe for instability, for multiple mega versions of the tragic boat people crossing the Mediterranean today. So, surely wealthy nations, especially in Europe, should urgently promote growing prosperity in Africa and not just for altruistic reasons. And another thing, if humanity's collective impact on land use and climate pushes too hard, the resultant ecological shock could irreversibly impoverish our biosphere. Extinction rates are rising. We are destroying the book of life before we've read it. Already there's more biomass in chickens and turkeys than in all the world's wild birds. And the biomass in humans, cows and domestic animals is 20 times that in wild mammals. Biodiversity is crucial for human well-being. We're clearly harmed if fish stocks dwindle to extinction. There are plants in the rainforest whose gene pool might be useful to us. But for many environmentalists, Preserving the richness of our biosphere has value in its own right, over and above what it means to us humans. To quote the great ecologist E.O. Wilson, mass extinction is the sin that future generations will least forgive us for. So the world's getting more crowded. And as a second firm prediction, it'll gradually get warmer. Now, in contrast to population issues, climate change is certainly not under-discussed. 
though it is, I think we'd all agree, under-responded to. The famous Keeling curve shows the concentration of CO2 and how it's risen over the last 50 years, mainly due to the burning of fossil fuels. The seasonal oscillations, incidentally, are because there's more vegetation in the northern hemisphere than the southern hemisphere. So in the autumn, the CO2 rises and leaves fall off the trees. But what's serious is this secular rise, of course. And the fifth IPCC report and its update a few months ago presents a spread of projections for different assumptions about fossil fuel use in the future, etc. And here are some of them. It's still unclear how much the direct effect of CO2 as a greenhouse gas is amplified by water vapour and cloud cover changing. This so-called climate sensitivity is a further uncertainty. That's indicated by the bars on the right, which reads to the left projections as an uncertainty due to the uncertain science. However, despite these uncertainties, there are two messages which most would agree on. One, regional disruptions to weather patterns and more extreme weather will, even within the next 20 years or so, aggravate pressures on food and water and enhance migration pressures. Two, under business-as-usual scenarios, we can't rule out, later in this century, warming, which is really catastrophic, and tipping points triggering long-term trends like the melting of Greenland's ice. So those two things will be agreed. But even those who accept both of those statements have diverse views on the policy response. And these divergences stem from differences in economics and ethics, in particular in how much obligation we should feel towards the long now, towards future generations. The Danish campaigner Born Lomberg has sort of bogeyman status among environmentalists, slightly unfairly, actually. But his Copenhagen consensus, a group of economists, they downplay the importance of addressing climate change compared to shorter-term efforts to help the world's poor. But the reason for that is that he applies a standard discount rate, 5% per year or something, which in effect writes off anything that happens after 2050. But if you care about those who live into the 22nd and beyond, century and beyond, and all babies today can expect that, then, as economists like Weizmann at Harvard argue, you would deem it worth paying an insurance premium now to protect those generations against the worst-case scenarios. You wouldn't use a standard discount rate. So even those who agree there's a significant risk of climate catastrophe a century hence will differ in how urgently they advocate action today. It'll depend on expectations of future growth, optimism about technical fixes, but above all, it depends on an ethical issue. In optimizing people's life chances, should we discriminate on grounds of date of birth? As a parenthesis, I'd note that there's one policy context where an essentially zero discount rate is applied, and that's to radioactive waste disposal, where the depositories are required to prevent leakage for 10,000 years or even more. Somewhat ironic when we can't plan the rest of energy policy even 30 years ahead. Consider this analogy. Suppose astronomers had tracked an asteroid and calculated that it would hit the Earth in 2080, 63 years from now. Not with certainty, but with, say, 10% probability. Would we relax, saying it's a problem that could be set on one side for 50 years, people would then be richer, and it may turn out he's going to miss the Earth anyway? I don't think we would. I think there'd be a consensus we should start straight away and do our damnedest to find ways to deflect the asteroid or mitigate its effect. What will actually happen on the climate policy front? The pledges that were made 
at the Paris conference and renewed in Poland recently are a positive step. But politicians won't gain much resonance by advocating unwelcome lifestyle changes now or a high carbon tax when the benefits accrue mainly in distant parts of the world and decades into the future. Jean Claude Juncker, head of the European Union Commission, famously said in a different context, we know what to do, but we don't know how to get re-elected when we do it. <laughs> and he's having problems with us Brits this week, as you probably know. But there's one win-win roadmap to a low-carbon future. Cleaner energy sources. I think nations should accelerate R&D into all forms of low-carbon energy generation and into other technologies where parallel progress is crucial, especially storage, batteries, compressed air, pumped storage, flywheels, etc., and smart grids. The faster these clean energies advance, the sooner will their prices fall. So they become affordable to, for instance, India, where they certainly need more generating capacity, where the health of the poor is now jeopardized by smoky stoves, burning wood and dung, and where there will otherwise be pressure for them to build coal-fired power stations. Sun and wind are, of course, the front runners, but other methods have geographical niches. Geothermal power in Iceland, for instance, and tidal energy is attractive where the topography induces especially large amplitude tides. And in fact, in my country, Britain's west coast is one such place, and there are proposals for tidal barrages and lagoons. But because of local intermittency, especially with sun and wind, we will need continental scale DC grids. In Europe, to carry solar energy from Morocco and Spain to less sunny northern nations, and east-west, to smooth peak demand over different time zones in this country and indeed in Eurasia. And maybe the latter should be part of China's Belt and Road Initiative. And despite wide ambivalence about nuclear energy, I think we should surely boost R&D into a variety of fourth generation concepts, which could prove to be far more flexible in size and safer than the ones we have now and the potential payoff of fusion is so great it's surely worth continuing experiments and prototypes. It would be hard to think of a more inspiring challenge for young engineers than devising clean and economical energy systems for the world. But if this transition is too slow, and if 20 years from now our climate seems heading irreversibly into dangerous territory, there may be pressure for panic measures. This could involve a plan B, being fatalistic about continuing dependence on fossil fuels, but combating its effects by either a massive investment in carbon capture and storage, or else by geoengineering. It's feasible, for instance, to inject enough aerosols into the stratosphere to cool the world's climate, a sort of artificial volcano. And indeed, what's scary is that this might be within the resources of a single nation, even a single corporation. And there could be unintended side effects. And, of course, the other consequences of rising CO2, like ocean acidification, would be unchecked. Geoengineering would be a political nightmare. Not all countries would want to, as it were, adjust the thermostat the same way. And indeed, the only beneficiaries would be the lawyers. They'd have a bonanza if nations could litigate over bad weather. <laughs> um, there is um, a more benign kind of uh, uh, geoengineering, direct extraction of CO2 from the atmosphere. This would be thereby undoing the geoengineering we've unwittingly done by burning fossil fuels. But a recent report from the National Academy emphasised that even this relatively benign policy, has downsides, especially in its implications for land use if you plant more and more trees. Incidentally, I've talked about science, and I should emphasize that in doing so, I include engineering and technology. Indeed, the latter are what's most important. 
And in fact, my engineering friends like a cartoon which shows two beavers looking up at a big hydroelectric dam. One beaver says to the other, I didn't actually build it, but it's based on my idea. <laughs> um, um, armchair theorists like me should be very modest compared to those who build things that work and meet public demand. And I like to say that the Swedish engineer who invented the zip fastener made a bigger intellectual leap than most theoretical physicists will ever do in their lifetime. <laughs> Well, we should be evangelists for new technologies, not Luddites. Without them, the world can't provide food and sustainable energy for an expanding and more demanding population. But we need wisely directed technology. Indeed, some are anxious that it's advancing so fast that we may not properly cope with it, and that we'll have a bumpy ride through this century. And my book expands on these concerns. We're ever more dependent on elaborate networks, electric power grids, air traffic control, international finance, just-in-time delivery, and so forth. Unless these globalized networks are highly resilient, their manifest benefits could be outweighed by catastrophic, albeit rare, breakdowns, real-world analogues of what happened in the financial system in 2008. <coughs> Our cities will be paralyzed without electricity, Supermarket shelves empty within days if supply chains were disrupted. And air travel can spread a pandemic worldwide within days. And social media can spread panic and rumour and economic contagion literally at the speed of light. And by the way, pandemics, natural ones, could cause far more societal breakdown now than in earlier centuries. English villages and towns like Ely in the 14th century continued to function even when the Black Death halved their population. The rest went on fatalistically. In contrast, our society here would be vulnerable to serious unrest as soon as hospitals were overwhelmed. And that would incur before the fatality rate got anywhere near even 1%. Advances in Microbiology, diagnostics, vaccines, and antibiotics offer prospects, of course, for containing pandemics. But the same research has some controversial aspects. Let me mention two of these. For instance, in 2012, a research group in Wisconsin and one in Holland showed it was surprisingly easy to make the flu virus more virulent and more transmissible. To some, this was a scary portent of things to come. And in 2014, the US federal government decided to cease funding these so-called gain-of-function experiments. Um, they've been renewed now, but with some restrictions. And the new CRISPR-Cas9 technique for gene editing is hugely promising, but there are ethical concerns and worries about possible runaway consequences of gene drive programs to wipe out species. As diverse as mosquitoes, where there'd be an attempt to wipe out the mosquito that carries the Zika virus, and some nasty people in England want to wipe out the grey squirrel, which is um, more successful in competing uh, than the uh, brown squirrel is. Well, back in the early days of recombinant DNA, a group of biologists met in Asilomar here in California, and they agreed on what experiments should and shouldn't be done. This encouraging precedent triggered several meetings in the last few years to discuss recent developments in the same spirit. But today, 40 years after the original Asilomar conference, the research community is far broader internationally, and more influenced by commercial pressure. And I'd worry that whatever regulations are imposed on prudential or ethical grounds on the use of these technologies can't be enforced worldwide any more than the drug laws can or the tax laws can. Whatever can be done will be done by someone somewhere. And that's a nightmare. 
whereas an atomic bomb can't be built without large-scale special purpose facilities, biotech involves small-scale dual-use equipment. Indeed, biohacking is burgeoning even as a hobby and competitive game. And we know all too well the technical expertise doesn't guarantee balanced rationality. The global village will have its village idiots, <laughs> and they will have global range. And the rising empowerment of tech-savvy groups, or even individuals, by bio as well as cyber technology, will pose an intractable challenge to governments, and I think aggravate the tension between freedom, privacy, and security. What about another key technology, robotics and AI? There are some concerns which are uh, relatively near term, as the concerns I have about biotech are, but there are deeper imponderables if we go further into the future. The smartphone, the web, and their ancillaries which are now ubiquitous today, would have seen magic even just 25 years ago. So looking several decades ahead, we must keep our minds open, or at least ajar, to transformative advances that may now seem science fiction. And clearly here, I can't make any good forecasts. But on the bio front, we might expect two things. Firstly, a better understanding of the combination of genes which determine key human characteristics and the ability to synthesize genomes that match these features. The great physicist Freeman Dyson conjectures a time when children will be able to design and create new organisms, just as routinely as his generation played with chemistry sets. Well, if it ever becomes possible to, as it were, play God on the kitchen table, our ecology and even our species may not survive very long unscathed. So what about another transformative technology, robotics and AI? Here, as I'm sure everyone here knows, there have been exciting advances in what's called generalized machine learning. Um, DeepMind, a London company now part of Google, achieves a remarkable feat. Um, it's computer beat the world champion in the game of Go, uh, there he is, and also uh, did the same uh, in, uh, in chess and other games. Now, this may at first sight not seem a big deal, because it's 20 years since IBM's Deep Blue beat Kasparov, the world chess champion. But Deep Blue was programmed in detail by expert players. In contrast, the machine that played Go and chess recently was given just the rules and gained expertise by playing hundreds of thousands of games against itself. And the programmers don't themselves know how the machines make some seemingly insightful decisions. And it is, of course, the speed of computers which allows them to succeed by these brute force methods and, indeed, to learn anything. They learn to identify dogs, cats, and human faces by crunching through millions of images, not the way babies learn. And they learn to translate by reading millions of pages of multilingual text. In Europe, they're given EU documents because their boredom threshold is infinite. <laughs> and they succeed by reinforced learning on these big training sets. But Learning about human behavior involves observing actual people in real homes or workplaces. And the machine would feel sensorily deprived by the slowness of real life and would be bewildered. To quote Stuart Russell, a leading AI theorist here at Berkeley, I quote, it could try all kinds of things, scrambling eggs, stacking wooden blocks, chewing wires, poking its finger into electric outlets. But nothing will produce a strong enough feedback loop to convince the computer it was on the right track and lead it to the next necessary action. And robots are still clumsier than a child in moving pieces on a real chessboard. They can't jump from tree to tree like a swirl. 
though a Boston Dynamics uh, robot um, called Handel can do backflops, apparently. But sensor technology is, of course, advancing fast. And even though the Go-playing computer used hundreds of kilowatts of power, the brain of its human challenger uses about 30 watts, just a light bulb. And he can do many other things apart from just play Go. Well, what will AI do? It won't just take over manual work. Indeed, plumbing and gardening will be among the hardest jobs to automate. But it'll do routine legal work, medical diagnostics, even surgery. And the big social and economic question is this. Will the new machine age be like earlier disruptive technologies, the car, for instance, and create as many jobs as it destroys? Or is it really different this time? Well, I think the answer to that will depend on economics and politics. Because the money earned by the robots will surely generate huge wealth for an elite and a few companies. But I suggest in my book that to preserve a healthy society will require massive redistribution of that income to ensure that everyone has at least a living wage. This shouldn't be just a handout, but should be achieved by creating and upgrading public service jobs where the human element's crucial, which are now undervalued, and where demand is huge. Above all, carers for young and old, but also custodians, gardeners in public parks and so forth. But caring for the old people is something where there's huge demand that's unmet, and it's frankly a more dignified job for a human being than working in an Amazon warehouse um, or uh, in, in, a, in a factory. This transition, which requires massive de redistribution of wealth, I can see this happening in Scandinavia and in China, but there might be ideological barriers in this country. But let's look still further ahead in robotics. How human-like will they be? AI can, of course, cope with fast-changing networks, traffic flow, electric grids, etc. And the Chinese could have an efficient planned economy of a kind that Marx could only dream of. And in science, too, perhaps AI can help us to find the recipe for a high-temperature superconductor or settle whether the string theory can really describe our universe because the geometry is just too complicated for humans to work through. If robots could not only do calculations but observe and interpret their environment as adeptly as we do, they would truly be perceived as intelligent beings to which or to whom we can relate. And, of course, such machines pervade movies and popular culture. So we'd have to ask, would we have obligations towards them? We worry if our fellow humans and even animals can't fulfill their natural potential. So should we feel guilty if our robots are underemployed or bored? <laughs> and what if a machine develops a mind of its own? Would it stay, ghost, stay ghost, uh, docile or go rogue? The popular culture portrays a dark side where AI gets out of its box, infiltrates the Internet of Things and pursues goals misaligned with human interests or even treats humans as an encumbrance. Some AI pundits take these concerns seriously and think the field already needs guidelines, just as biotech surely does. But others, like, for instance, Rodney Brooks, inventor of the uh, Baxter robot and the Roomba vacuum cleaner, he regards these concerns as premature. He thinks it'll be a long time before artificial intelligence is a bigger worry than real stupidity. <laughs> but... Be that as it may, it's likely that society will be transformed by autonomous robots, even though the jury's out on whether they'll be idiot savant or display superhuman capability. Ray Kurzweil, the futurologist, now working at Google, he argues 
that once machines have surpassed human capabilities, they could themselves design and assemble a new generation of even more powerful ones, an intelligence explosion. He thinks humans could transcend biology by merging with computers. In old-style spiritualist parlance, they would go over to the other side. We then confront the classic philosophical problem of personal identity. If your brain were downloaded into a machine, in what sense would it still be you? Should you feel relaxed about your body then being destroyed? What would happen if several clones were made of you? And is the input into our sense organs and physical interactions with the real external world so essential to our being that this transition would be not only abhorrent but also impossible? These are ancient conundrums for philosophers, but practical ethicists may soon need to address them. Kurzweil, incidentally, is a proponent of the so-called singularity, but he's worried that it may not happen in his lifetime. So he wants his body frozen, his blood replaced by liquid nitrogen, until immortality is on offer, and he can then be resurrected into some post-human world. I was surprised, actually, to find that three of my British academic colleagues had gone in for this so-called cryonics. Two had paid the full whack, about $80,000, to a company in Arizona, and the third had taken the cut price option of just having his head frozen. <laughs> I'm glad they were all from Oxford and not from my university. <laughs> and I told them I'd rather end my days in an English churchyard than an American refrigerator. <laughs> yes. um, but of course, uh, uh, more seriously, um, research on ageing is being seriously prioritised. We have to ask here, will the benefits be incremental or is ageing a disease that can be cured? Dramatic life extension will plainly be a real wild card in population projections with huge social ramifications. But it may happen along with human enhancement in other forms. It's at least surely on the cards that human beings, their mentality and their physique, may become malleable through the deployment of genetic modification and cyborg technologies. Moreover, this future evolution, the kind of secular intelligent design, would take only centuries, in contrast to the thousands of centuries needed for Darwinian evolution. And this is a game changer. When we admire the literature and artifacts that have survived from antiquity, we feel an affinity across a time gulf of thousands of years with those ancient artists and their civilizations. But we can have zero confidence that the dominant intelligence is a few centuries hence will have any emotional resonance with us, even though they may have some algorithmic understanding of how we behave. And now I turn to another technology, space. This is where robots surely have a future and where, I will argue, changes will happen fastest and should worry us least. During this century, the whole solar system will be explored by swarms of miniaturized probes, far more advanced than the wonderful Cassini designed in the 1990s, which spent 13 years exploring Saturn, or the NASA pro, or, or the uh, ESA European probe that went to this comet and landed a robot on it, um, or the NASA probe uh, that sent back these pictures of Pluto, 20,000 times further away than the moon, and of course more recently uh, of this uh, uh, minor planet a billion miles further away still. Think back to the computers and phones of the 1990s when these probes were designed and realize how much better we can do today. The next step will be the deployment in space of robotic fabricators, which can build large structures, for instance, giant telescopes with huge gossamer thin mirrors assembled under zero G. A feasible goal for such an instrument, incidentally, would be to resolve an image of an Earth-like planet around another star. And I think a nice target would be to do this by the year 2068. 
the centenary of the iconic Earthrise image I showed earlier of our Earth taken from lunar orbit. A picture of another Earth around another star will be a new iconic image. But what about manned spaceflight? The practical case gets ever weaker with each advance in robotics and miniaturization. So will it have a resurgence? It's nearly 50 years since Neil Armstrong's one small step, and I cherish this picture signed for me a few years ago by seven of the Apollo astronauts. In the 1960s, there was, of course, a space race against the Russians. NASA got about 4% of the federal budget. And had that pace continued, there had been footprints on Mars long ago. But once the race to the moon was won, there was no motivation, and I think the NASA budget is now about 0.6% of uh, the budget. But hundreds more have ventured into space, but ant anticlimactically, they've done no more than circle the Earth in low orbit, mostly in the International Space Station. And this, frankly, only makes news when something goes wrong. When the loo fails, for instance, or when they or when they perform stunts, such as the Canadian Chris Hadfield playing his guitar and singing. So will there be any inspirational Apollo-type projects in future? There's no denying that NASA's curiosity and its recent successor trundling across the surface of Mars may miss startling discoveries which no human geologist would overlook. But machine learning is advancing fast as is sensor technology. In contrast, the cost gap between manned and unmanned missions remains huge. NASA's manned program ever since Apollo has been impeded by public and political pressure into being very risk averse. The space shuttle failed twice in 135 launches. Each of those, you remember, was a trauma and halted the program for three years because the shuttle had unwisely been proposed and promoted as safe for civilians. Because of this safety culture, NASA will confront political obstacles in achieving any grand goal within a feasible budget. China has the resources and the Dirigis government, and maybe the willingness to undertake an Apollo-style program. It's already going to be building a lunar base, but if you really wanted to assert superpower status by a space spectacular and to proclaim parity with the US, it would need to leapfrog, not just rerun what the US did 50 years earlier. And the clear-cut great leap forward would be footprints on Mars, not just on the moon. But leaving aside the Chinese, I think the future of manned spaceflight lies with privately funded adventurers prepared to participate in a cut-price program far riskier than Western nations could impose on publicly supported civilians. Elon Musk's SpaceX and Jeff Bezos' Blue Origins will soon offer orbital flights to paying customers. Were I an American, I would only support NASA's unmanned program. I'd argue that private enterprise ventures bringing a Silicon Valley culture into a domain long dominated by NASA and a few aerospace conglomerates should front all manned missions as cut-price, high-risk ventures. There will be many volunteers, some perhaps even accepting one-way tickets, driven by the same motives as early explorers, mountaineers and the like. And the future role of the national agencies will be attenuated, becoming more like an airport than an airline. And the phrase space tourism should be avoided. It lulls people into thinking that such ventures are routine. And if that's a perception, the inevitable accidents will be as traumatic as those of the space shuttle were. These exploits must be sold as dangerous sports or intrepid exploration. Nonetheless, by 2100, thrill seekers may have established bases independent from the Earth, probably on Mars. And Musk himself, uh, age 47, says he wants to die on Mars, but not on impact. <laughs> and he might. But don't ever expect mass emigration from the Earth. No way in our solar system offers an environment even as clement as the Antarctic or the top of Everest. And here I disagree with Musk and with my late colleague Stephen Hawking. I think it's a dangerous delusion 
to think that space offers an escape from Earth's problems. <laughs> Dealing with climate change on Earth is a doddle compared to terraforming Mars. There's no planet B for ordinary risk-averse people. Nonetheless, we should cheer on these brave space adventurers because they will have a pivotal role in spearheading the post-human future in the 22nd century and beyond. This is why they'll be ill-adapted to their Martian habitat. So they'll have a more compelling incentive than those of us on Earth to redesign themselves. They'll harness the super-powerful genetic and cyborg technologies that will be developed in coming decades. These techniques will, one hopes, be constrained here on Earth on prudential and ethical grounds. But the settlers on Mars will be beyond the clutches of the regulators. <laughs> and we surely wish them good luck in modifying their progeny to adapt to alien environments. And this might be the first step towards divergence into a new species. So it's these spacefaring adventurers, not those of us comfortably adapted to life on Earth, who will spearhead the post human era. Moreover, if they make the transition to fully inorganic intelligence, they won't need an atmosphere, and they may prefer zero-G. So it's in deep space, not on Earth or even on Mars, that non-biological brains may develop powers that humans can't even imagine. Few doubt that machines will gradually surpass or enhance more and more of our distinctively human capabilities. As I said, Ray Kurzweil and his ilk say it'll be a few decades. The cautious amongst us imagine centuries. But either way, the time scale for technological advance is but an instant compared to the time scale for the Darwinian evolution that led to humanity's emergence. And more relevantly, less than a millionth of the vast expanse of cosmic time lying ahead. So the outcome of future technology and its evolution could surpass humans by as much as we intellectually surpass a slime mold. What about consciousness? Philosophers debate whether consciousness is special to the wet organic brains of humans, apes and dogs. Might it be that electronic intelligences, even if their intellect seems superhuman, will still lack self-awareness or inner life? Or is consciousness emergent in any sufficiently complex network so that these post-humans would ha still have it, even if electronic. Well, some say this is an irrelevant semantic issue, like asking whether submarines can swim. But I don't think it is. This question crucially affects how we react to the far future scenario I've sketched. If the machines are zombies, we'd not accord their experiences the same value as ours, and the post-human future would seem bleak. But if they're conscious, we should surely welcome the prospect of their future hegemony. A word about the very far future. Even if life had originated only on the Earth, it need not remain a trivial feature of the cosmos because there's enough time for it to start a diaspora whereby ever more complex intelligence spreads through the whole galaxy. Vast self-reproducing machines, transmitting DNA, instructions for 3D printers or such like. Interstellar voyages or even intergalactic voyages are not going to be terror for near immortals. But this raises the question which astronomers are most often asked. Is there life out there already? We all agree that we don't know. Well. Not quite all. I mean, I and other storms get letters from people who've uh, uh, met the aliens, been abducted by them. Uh, and uh, I tell such people, do they really think that having traversed interstellar distances, the aliens would uh, just meet one or two well-known cranks and go away again? And also I say, why don't these people write to each other and not write to me? <laughs> well. Well, most of us don't know, but we know that there's no way in our solar system where there's any advanced life. 
But there may be some simple life. There may be freeze-dried bacteria on Mars. There may be creatures swimming under the ice on Saturn's moon Enceladus. But let's widen our horizon to the realm of the stars. We've learned that most of these are orbited by retinues of planets, like the Sun is. But the evidence is mainly indirect. We don't observe the planets, but we detect their influence on the motion or brightness of the stars they're orbiting. And the special interest in planets which are like the Earth. And there are literally millions of those in our galaxy. And we can see the nearest among them. And some have been found. One of the most remarkable is this object, which is a miniature solar system, seven planets orbiting around a very faint star, an M dwarf. And the years for these planets vary from a day and a half for the innermost to 18 days for the outermost. Would there be any life on, on them? We have no idea. They're very spectacular places. This is an artist's impression of what it might be like to live on one of them. Viewed from one of these planets, the others would loom larger than our moon does to us, swinging fast across our sky. But they're very unearthly. They're probably all tidally locked, presenting their same face to the sun. So there'd be a sort of apartheid where everyone lives in one half facing the sun, except the astronomers who are in the other half. <laughs> Well, all the evidence we have for these exoplanets so far is indirect, detecting their effect on the motion or brightness of the star they're going around. We'd really like to observe them directly. But that's hard. To realise just how hard an alien astronomer um, supposing with a powerful telescope looking at our sun might be able to see our Earth. Suppose they could, then the Earth would look like a pale blue dot, in Carl Sagan's nice phrase, very close in the sky to its star, our sun, and a billion times fainter. But if the aliens had a big enough intelligence that they could, big enough telescope, that they could uh, observe this uh, planet, observe our Earth, they could learn quite a bit about it. The shade of blue would be slightly different depending on whether the Pacific Ocean or the landmass of Asia is facing them. So they could learn that there were continents and oceans, the length of the day, something of the seasons, and the climate. By analyzing the faint light, they could infer it had a biosphere. We can't do this yet, but the next generation of telescopes can. Uh, this is um, uh, the ELT, the European Extremely Large Telescope. <laughs> uh, they're not imaginative in, in their nomenclature. But this is going to be the world's biggest telescope. 39 meter uh, diameter mirror, that's probably the, the width of this lecture hall. Um, and that will be able to make observations like I've envisaged of our Earth, of Earth-like planets around other stars. And two slightly smaller American telescopes uh, will come online at about the same time. So this is going to be uh, a very exciting prospect in the near future. Well, they will find lots of habitable planets where water could exist, but hab habitable doesn't mean inhabited. And for most of us, that's the number one question. We still don't know the likelihood. Indeed, we don't know how life emerged on Earth. We don't know whether it was a rare fluke or whether it was inevitable. We don't know what triggered the transition from complex molecules to entities that can metabolize and reproduce. Moreover, even if simple life were widespread, we can't assess the odds that it evolves into a complex biosphere. And even if it did, it might be unrecognizably different. But the question, are we alone, fascinates so many that I think SETI searches are worthwhile, even though the chance of success is small. And I'm actually the chair of the advisory group for Yuri Milner's Breakthrough Listen Project. But that's a topic for a different lecture, or maybe for the question period. So let me conclude by focusing back closer to the here and now. To emphasize that even in these 
cosmic timeline, extending billions of years into the future as well as into the past, we are living in a special century. The first in Earth history when one species is empowered to control the fate of the entire biosphere. To jumpstart a transition to entities that far transcend our limitations, or to take a darker view to foreclose the immense future potential and leave an anarchic and depleted planet. My book emphasizes how our society is brittle, interconnected and vulnerable. We fret unduly about small risks, air crashes, carcinogens in food, low radiation doses, etc. But we're in denial about some newly emergent threats, which could be globally devastating. Some are environmental, others are the potential downsides of novel technologies, which could cascade globally in our interconnected world. Innovations bring great hopes, but also great fears. And as a wise mantra, the unfamiliar is not the same as the improbable. So how can we forestall catastrophes and ensure a brighter future? The trouble is that even the best politicians focus mainly on the urgent and parochial and getting re-elected. This is an endemic frustration for those who've been official science advisors in government. To attract politicians' attention, you must get headlined in the press and fill their inboxes. So scientists can have more leverage indirectly by campaigning. We need more Carl Sagan-type figures. We can all engage, though, by involvement with NGOs, by blogging and journalism, or through political activities. Let me mention two recent advances, uh, um, examples of how the public has been influenced. In 2015, there was a papal encyclical which had a worldwide influence in the lead-up to the Paris Climate Conference, saying that humans had a duty to the environment. There's no gain saying the church's global reach, its long-term vision and concern for the world's poor. And the Pope got a standing ovation at the UN and it's had a big effect on forging consensus at Paris. And to take a UK example recently, there's now proposed legislation on uh, non-degradable plastic waste. And this wouldn't have happened without the consciousness raising images in David Attenborough's recent Blue Planet 2 TV programs. I'm not sure if they've been shown over here. In particular, the image of an albatross returning from wandering thousands of miles in the Southern Ocean and regurgitating for its young, not the hoped for nourishment, the plastic debris. That's an image as iconic as the uh, polar bear on the melting ice flow. And that certainly influenced UK politicians to take ocean plastic seriously. We may be political pessimists, but we must surely, despite all I've said, proclaim that these technologies can boost the developed as well developing world, and we should not be too much concerned about the downsides. Otherwise, we'll never do anything. The precautionary principle can't be carried too far. And my book on the future offers some tentative hopes, fears, and recipes, and highlights the need to assess which scary scenarios can be dismissed as science fiction and how best to avoid the credible ones. We're all on this crowded Earth together. Spaceship Earth is hurtling through the void. Its passengers are anxious and fractious. The life support system is vulnerable to disruption and breakdowns. But there's too little planning, too little horizon scanning. We need to think globally. We need to think rationally. Empowered by 21st century technology, but guided by values that science itself can't provide. And above all, we need to think long term. I've already highlighted the world's religions. And as all of us here know, a secular organization, the Long Now Foundation, will create a symbol that contrasts dramatically with our currently pervasive short-termism. In the cavern deep underground, a massive clock will be built, designed to tick for 10,000 years, to resound with a different chime every day over that expanse of time. Those of us who visit it this century will contemplate a monument built to outlast the cathedrals and will be inspired to hope that 100 centuries from now it will indeed still be ticking and that some of our progeny will still be there to visit it. And I give the very last word to one of my scientific heroes, the eloquent biologist Peter Medawar. I quote, 
The bells that toll for mankind are like the bells of alpine cattle. They're attached to our own neck, and it must be our fault if they don't make a tuneful and melodious sound. Thank you very much for listening. question I'll get into once in the cards here yeah, yeah. Uh, you're especially good on astronomical risks and non risks mm -hmm. and um, we have a couple people from the foundation b612 here we'll make sure that asteroids will yeah. not be the mm -hmm. uh, threatening thing that happened to 66 mm -hmm. million years ago mm -hmm. and so we're probably fine on that for the foreseeable future as long as they get properly funded um, mm -hmm. But I wonder about comets. Comets are so unlike asteroids, they come out mm. and, and uh, I've heard some very bleak scenarios of, boy, if a comet comes, it's too fast, it's too surprising, you can't yeah. do anything about it, and blam, we're dead. Yes. How about that? Well, it's certainly the case that you can't uh, predict the, them so far in advance because they come in from deep space and their orbits aren't quite so predictable. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it would be harder to, um, uh, to forecast which ones are going to be dangerous. Um, uh, they're probably less likely than asteroids, but uh, I think it's great what's being done to identify asteroids and risk their risks. Because asteroids are the risks that we can most easily quantify. We know roughly how many there will, will be of different sizes and what they will do. And it's right that we do something to reduce that risk. But the important point I'd want to make is that um, the risk from asteroids is not getting any bigger. It's the same for us as it was for the Neanderthals and even for the dinosaurs. So it's non-zero, uh, but it's, it's steady. Whereas the kind of risks that I'm concerned about, which I focused on, are those we're creating, which are getting bigger and bigger <coughs> year by year, and where we don't have a long time base to assess how likely they are. And uh, we can't be complacent, we'll survive them for the long term. So uh, although we should worry about the um, astronomical risks, they don't keep me awake at night. It's the mm -hmm. others, which are larger risks already and growing with time. Neutron stars, things like that, uh, uh, setting off nearby. And, and d d well, they could happen, but very unlikely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, here's a question. Famous from... last words. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, no one would hear them. Yeah, and yeah. No one would care about them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nikki uh, Galinis, it looks like, says uh, national policy reactions are central to a lot of your themes, the, the human caused yes. threats. Uh, what do you think is the future of the nation state in all of this, if any? Well, I mean, that's, uh, that's very interesting because clearly some of them have to be uh, dealt with on a global level. I mean, climate change, most obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and so he's got to, and uh, dealing with pandemics and all these things and regulation need to be global. So we do need to beef up international organizations or perhaps have rather more along the lines of the IAEA and the World Health Organization to cope with all these things. Um, and of course, uh, um, we have um, uh, large companies which transcend national boundaries. So I think we should have uh, public service bodies that do as well. And so we certainly need more of that. So uh, national boundaries are not enough. But of course, to generate enthusiasm for these goals can perhaps be done at the national level. And so it could be that we can help as citizens to activate our own politicians, maybe the state level or city level, if not the federal level, um, and do that more effectively than directly trying to have a global effect. Well, I wonder, the United Nations sort of was a result of a World War, uh, mm -hmm. the Second World War, and there was a sense of global threat that emerged from that, and then yeah. the United Nations was a response to try to keep a global peace going. Climate change is a global threat mm -hmm. of quite a different order than the rather episodic mm -hmm. World War yeah, II. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that headed in the direction of a, of a global governance which is much more strict than what we have now? Well, it needs it, but of course the problem with climate change is it is a threat is long-term. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And uh, as I mentioned, you've got to have a psychological discount rate which is low in order to worry about it at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we've got to um, persuade people they do need to think long term and care about what may happen in the lifetime of babies born today uh, who will be alive in the, the year 2020. Um, and so... 120. And so I think that's what we, what we need, need to do. Um, but uh, as I say, I'm pessimistic about the traditional way of dealing with climate change because they're asking for a sacrifice now for this rather remote and uncertain goal. And that's why I really do think that R&D into clean energy should be prioritised on the same level as defence research or medical research so that we can really have uh, not just uh, far cheaper, more efficient um, uh, solar and wind, but uh, maybe entirely new kinds of power and maybe new kinds of nuclear, fourth generation mm -hmm. modular reactors and things like that. Um, because if we just focus on that completely, it's a win-win because the uh, countries and places like Silicon Valley, if they develop these innovations for clean energy and, or, and storage and uh, superconducting grids and all that, then that will be hugely beneficial for them commercially, but also will help Indians to leapfrog directly from, from uh, um, smoky stoves, burning wood and dung, to clean energy. So I think that should be the priority. And that, in my view, is going to be the only way in which we really will see a reduction in carbon dioxide emissions early enough to make a difference. So you mentioned fusion in that line, that yes, we should keep yes. trying. Yes, Do you yes. have high or low hopes for, for fusion? Um, well, I'm not an expert. I mean, uh, I, I would, I bet at least even if we'd have uh, one power station within 30 or 40 years. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I just think that in the context of $10 trillion a year being spent on energy and infrastructure, then the few billion a year being spent on uh, fusion R&D is more than justified. But fission as well, mm -hmm. the, the, uh, because the right. designs that are used for the current reactors are 40 or 50 years out of date. There's been hardly any recent R&D. What happens after climate change is sorted out? Say it's a century, century and a half yes. problem. Mm -hmm. uh, one sense I get is the sea levels will keep rising for a good while, even a bit, if we yeah, stabilize yes. things. So that is a, mm -hmm. a kind of a flux for generations, especially people going mm -hmm. to the coasts with mm -hmm. their cities. Um, so in a sense, we're looking at a continually changing Earth, even if we get the fossil fuel emissions and so on under control. Mm -hmm. How do you see that playing out over time? Um, well, I think if it's slow enough, we can cope with it. Um, and uh, uh, I think the, the other point is that um, if countries get more developed, then they can cope with it like the Dutch clearly can. Mm -hmm. um, but clearly, it's going to be, be long term. But I think other things we need to worry about are going to be whether the population stabilizes, whether mm -hmm. Uh, the, we can preserve biodiversity, etc. So to be all these issues, because we were putting different kinds of pressures on the planet, mm -hmm. and some of them are going to be very serious. But climate change, I think we could deal with if we can get over the next 50 years and avoid the CO2 concentration rising to this dangerous level where there might be tipping points. As I say, I think the only hope of doing that will be very efficient and uh, very highly funded R and D. And do you think? Geoengineering to buy time for all of that to happen is a, a thing that well, research should go forward for or likely uh, deploy? I, I, I think, think research should be done, yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, some people don't even think that because, uh, you know, at least a moral hazard, people don't care about the, the others. But I certainly think research should be done, yes. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, Kevin Kelly asks, how will science, the scientific method, change by 2050? Some believe that significant discovery has actually been slowing down lately. The trend is not toward more amazing science, but toward lots and lots of less amazing science. Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> yes. Well, I don't think that's true. I mean, I think that's often said about particle physics, where indeed it is true. Right, ran out of particles, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think there are lots of particles, but they're beyond the scope. I mean, I think the, the cosmic dark matter is, is particles, but they may be a thousand times heavier 
than can be detected by any accelerator we can build. That's quite okay. possible. Um, so it, it is true that in particle physics, the, uh, the only exciting discovery in the last 30 years has been about neutrinos. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it would be perverse to say there haven't been huge discoveries in, uh, in biology, genetics, and in astronomy. Exoplanets. We knew nothing about them 20 years ago. Most of what we know is the last few years. That's, that's a huge thing. And we've learned more about the very early universe um, and uh, uh, not to mention all the rest of science. So I think the, the overall pace of science um, is um, I I accelerating, if anything else, because more people are active. It's true that the low-hanging fruit's been picked off, and that's certainly true in particle physics. But uh, I don't think it's true in all fields. And, of course, um, computers help a lot. I, I mean, I wasn't joking when I said that it could be AI that will actually um, uh, solve string theory, because string theory is extremely complicated. C lots of geometry in, uh, in ten dimensions. And maybe no human can ever grasp it. But it could be that a machine, the kind of machine that can teach itself to play world-class chess in three hours, may be able to uh, do the calculations and see if the particular version of string theory does uh, predict uh, that the proton has the right mass and things like that. So I genuinely think that we can be helped by AI in scientific projects. And another example I quoted was um, finding the sort of alloy that gives you a room temperature superconductor. This is uh, uh, very difficult to do, just like you've got to test lots of chemicals, just like in drug development. But this is where machines can help. Uh -huh. So there's an so acceleration. acceleration, I think, in, yeah. in some respects. Um, life Could I make one other point? Which is that there may, despite all that, be some important uh, physical ideas which are just beyond our human brain. Just like a monkey can't understand quantum theory, there may be some uh, fundamental aspect of nature which we're not even aware of and couldn't understand if we were. You're 76, I'm 80. Here's a question about life extension. Don't rub it in. <laughs> <laughs> On the contrary, I think the, your uh, wise perspective has to do with your age. Uh, you know, would you have been able, to, at the age of you know, 30, typical age here in San Francisco, have had any of the insight that you've been uh, laying on us today? No. I don't know. From ah, I don't know, check it. <laughs> anyway, here's a question, it's anonymous. Uh, life extension, including cryonics, means older adults today, will pl you can expect to be here in the 22nd century. Very interesting statement. If people don't use a low discount rate for themselves, isn't that interesting as we get longer-lived people mm -hmm. as time goes by? Mm -hmm. And that, in a sense, long-term thinking comes with longer-lived people. Um. I think it does, but I think many people, uh, uh, if, if they are not going to live a long time, they do care about their children and grandchildren. And uh, uh, even if people aren't going to live beyond 70 on average, then uh, they know their grandchildren will be alive in the 22nd century. And I think th that is what motivates long-term thinking. And uh, uh, they would be unhappy if uh, there was no world... 200 years from now mm -hmm. for their descendants, even though no one now alive would uh, realize what do, was happening in the world in the year 2200. So I think, it, I think we feel we're part of some ongoing process. And just as we uh, realize that we uh, benefit from the heritage of earlier centuries in the mm -hmm. infrastructure and literature and science and everything else, uh, I think most of us would be unhappy if we thought that there'd be no long-term survival of anything that we were involved in. So I think we do, in some sense, do have a low discount rate in some mm -hmm. contexts. Mm -hmm. But not enough, I agree with you. Um, Isabel Santos asks, what about biological carbon sequestration strategies? Yep. Um, Garrett Grinery mm -hmm. here is yes. talking about expanding, uh, doing yes. a lot of kelp. Yes, kelp yeah. uh, enormously fixes carbon. Yes. There's uh, grass, mm. yes. the questioner asked. There's yes. Yes. lots more trees, mm. yes. and there's presumably some kinds of air capture that could yes. be yes. done non biologically. Mm. What's um, your hope? No, I mean, uh, I think uh, that was in the uh, National Academy report that I mentioned, and mm. uh, I think it's feasible. I mean, I think the, the two concerns I mean, one is that it's going to distort land use because you need lots of land. Mm. to do this. I mean, maybe algae or something like that can get, get around that. But, but uh, if you're going to use trees, then it needs lots of land. And, of course, there's a big problem of dealing with the CO2. 
um, the, the idea of um, uh, having to sort of um, safely store underground or somewhere several billion tons of CO2 per year mm -hmm. is not a trivial task. And, and, and I think that's got to be coped with if this is worthwhile. I mean, one hope is that uh, you can sort of send the carbon to the abyss in the ocean. Yes. Either in the well, right, that's, a, that's one possible idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That it could stay there for quite yes, a while. Yes, I think below two and a half miles, its, its density is above that of water and it sinks. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Science on land is pretty thorough. We've been on land, we're land animals ourselves. Um, my sense is that the oceans, and this is a, our friend Jim Lovelock has gone on about this, that, mm -hmm. that our knowledge of the oceans is you know, pretty thin yes. still. And yet it's an ocean planet, it's a blue planet. Mm -hmm. And we don't know all the processes going on there. We don't know all the life forms there, certainly. Mm -hmm. We don't know exactly how they relate. Right. Um, and the oceans are this enormous event in terms of climate change. And... Um, What's your sense of the role of ocean science, especially under the pressure of climate change and the need to understand more mm. in the coming decades? Well, I think, as you say, it's crucial that we've got to bottle the atmosphere and the oceans because they're the main store of mm. CO2 and, of course, of heat. Um, and it's also true that we, uh, don't un we don't have a good map of the ocean bed mm -hmm. uh, to the extent that we have of Mars or the Moon, and that does seem an anomaly, so I think we need to study those. And of course, as far as feeding 9 or 11 billion people, uh, then of course there may be a lot of scope um, um, in, the, in the oceans. And that's why I don't worry particularly about feeding people. I guess the last question, and everything sort of bears relation to, you know, are you pessimistic or optimistic? Or, um, you know, as a scientist, you're used to mm -hmm stating things in terms of odds and uh, an error bar. What's your sense of the spot prospects of getting out of this special century, not only alive, but thriving? Mm. Well, very high chance of being alive in the sense of the mm -hmm. uh, uh, most unlikely that anything to wipe out humanity. There are a few things that could, but they're most unlikely. Um, but I think we will have a bumpy ride. I mean, I, I think that um, uh, governance is going to get harder hmm. um, for reasons we're starting to see, and particularly because of unintended consequences, scientific developments, and above all, the fact that a few people can cause serious disruption. I mean, hmm. um, we know that cyber attacks um, could be disruptive, the electricity grid in the city or the whole eastern seaboard of the United States, things like that, complete catastrophe mm -hmm. could be caused. Um, and even a trivial case, we had a, um, a, a, in, in England just two weeks ago, um, someone saw a drone over Gatwick Airport. And, yeah. um, uh, and that one sighting of one drone shut down the whole airport for two days. And uh, so it's just very easy because we are so risk averse and uh, so interconnected that a few people can disrupt society. And I think there's going to be a problem making society resilient against that sort of disruption. That, I think, is one of the main challenges to governance that we're going to have to face. The lone weirdo. Yeah, well, I can't wait for the rest of the century that we get to see, because <laughs> among the specialness is that it keeps being full of surprises. And uh, <laughs> that, we're not really sure how it's going to come out. But we're looking at it from this cosmic perspective that you brought, and that mm. is formidable. Mm. Thank mm. you very yes. much. Mm. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.